So guys, Weekend Modder here. We're going to go through a RGH 1.2 on this Jasper Modern Warfare 2 edition. And I wanted to talk real briefly about the tools that we're going to be using. So the glitch chip that we're actually going to make use of here is going to be the Matrix 1 or Matrix 1.1. You can see here it's a real basic, not a lot to it sort of chip. Uh, it's labeled A through F and then it has power and ground points. Um, so we'll cover that more in depth. And then I'm going to be using the Nandex programmer here to both read write my NAND and to program the glitch chip. So it's going to perform two functions. Via this cable that you see here, this is going to be how we're going to program the glitch chip. So this little bit of pin header stuck in there uh, will, allows us to insert those pins into the receptacles on the glitch chip. And then uh, this wire that I'm plugging in now is the NAND read wire. So you can see on the end of mine I've got some uh, resistor leg soldered on there. Uh, but these are the tools that we're going to be using, a Nandex and a Matrix Glitcher. Hang out with me and uh, we'll walk through the RGH process. Alright, so um, I don't often do a decasing video here. Uh, or remove the case on camera. All right, so now we've got it all decased, and uh, first step here, we're gonna go ahead and uh, use the fiberglass scratch pin to remove the top coating across the NAND headers. So by doing this, uh, we're essentially just making it easier for the solder to That's stick. The, uh, the pin header fiberglass scratch pin can be had for three or four dollars on eBay. Now that we've uh, scratched off the coating, we're going to go ahead and put a layer of flux paste down. Uh, this can be scored off Amazon or eBay for just a couple of bucks as well. It's just a kind of uh, thick consistency flux, uh, which is not optional. I frequently get asked if, if you can kind of skip the flux. Uh, certainly no, especially if you're using non-rosin or solder. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that you're using some flux there. So the next thing we're really going to want to do is uh, install the NAND header wires. You can see the install center screen here uh, where it says NANDX install Xbox 360 FAT. That's the color-coded wires in installation uh, guide used by uh, the Matrix uh, programmer, the JRP, the Nandex, uh, they all use the same header. So you see them labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and then 6 and 7. So what we'll do first is uh, pre-tin those pads, kind of just getting them uh, with a, a little glob of solder on top. And then um, we'll attach the actual Nand header wires from there. So what, what you'll see me do here first is uh, actually just called tinning the pads. So I'm not trying to stick anything to them yet. I'm just melting down the, so the, the flux paste and then putting a little bead of solder on top of each pad. So here you can see I've got uh, all of them tinned up. I'm doing the ground pad. Uh, that, that last one, the number five or yellow pad, can often take a little bit of extra heat held to it. The ground plane tends to dissipate some heat so it can take a little bit of extra on that particular pad. Uh, and then we have to move up to the, uh, the upper header and then uh, we'll actually tin three spots on this one. So we'll do the green and blue wire six and seven for the NAND install as well as the three volt point where we will later connect the, uh, the power wire. So that's the, the last one that I'm doing there. So the upper and lower ones are uh, five and six and then that one to the right is the uh, three volt spot. So uh, from here, the, the next actual point we're gonna do is actually installing the NAND header wires. So this is just a standard default set of NAND wires that I reinforced with some hot glue and then added resistor legs on the end to make them a little bit more durable. Um, so since I've got little solder globs on each pad kind of built up, you can see that what I can in essence do is simply hold the, uh, the line right there, tap the solder, and then kind of shove the, uh, the end of that resistor leg or the end of the wire into it. So that, that technique just gets repeated. So I, I get in position, I tap 
the uh, the solder glob with the iron and then I insert the uh, appropriate color-coded one referencing back to that diagram we looked at earlier and then I've also got some kind of uh, helpful little bins in the end um, to whatever makes sense to you where you can get comfortable access to the NAND wires but basically uh, you're just going to want to follow the install diagram uh, for your uh, fat console based on that image that we showed earlier. Alright, so now we're moving to the upper header uh, where we have again that six and seven, the blue and green wires. And then remember that that pad to the right of, of where we're installing, that will be later used uh, as the three volt power source. Um, and I, I'm, I'm touching it there a little bit because it looks like I picked up the solder glob off of it, um, which I can always retin and add later, but I'm just kind of sharing some of the solder between them so that they behave right. So you can see that it's tacked down to there um, nice and solidly. So uh, our next step will, to be, will be to actually apply some standby power, uh, connect up our NANDX, and get a NAND read. Um, so we don't need that NAND to see our programming cable right now. We just need the normal NANDX header into the NANDX. And then we want to apply uh, standby power here. So we'll connect the power, but we're not turning the console on at all. It's just connected to aka standby power. So now we'll uh, migrate over to the desktop, hit the little question mark box in JRunner, and uh, if everything's installed properly you should get a valid flash config, you should make sure your NAND reads are set at 2, and then go ahead and hit read NAND, and uh, as you'll see the progress bar will start ticking away as you take duplicate copies of the currently onboard NAND. So this is what we call doing the NAND dump or basically making a copy of the current retail NANDs. These are going to be, the files will end up named NAND dump 1 and NAND dump 2.bin. Alright, so while the NAND dump was occurring, uh, I went ahead and did the LEDs on the console. I'm not going to cover that in depth on this video because I have a separate video dedicated already to how to perform the LED modification. Um, but I, I needed this section of video uh, to offer some commentary because what I did is I allowed the NAND dumps to complete off screen. So what you should see when you um, return to JRunner here is that the NAND dump 1 and NAND dump 2s have completed successfully. There should be a message in the log area, the black background area that says NAND dumps are the same which indicates that the first copy and the second copy are identical. So there you go, NAND dumps are the same. So because RGH 1.2 requires a glitch 2 image, we make sure the glitch 2 is selected, make sure our motherboard is selected, and then we hit create ECC followed by write ECC. This goes nice and fast because the writing is only the first 50 blocks, so it happens in just 10 seconds or so. So now we have successfully written the ECC file and the console would be ready to boot Zell uh, once it has a glitch chip installed. So our next steps will be uh, just that, to go ahead and install the glitch chip. So we want to disconnect our NANDX, we want to remove the standby power, and then we'll go ahead and place and begin installing our glitch chip. So the chip that we're going to use for this install is a Matrix V1. Um, we we'll go ahead and position it there on top of the AV shield using a little bit of double-sided tape, uh, or you can just loop over some electrical tape. It really uh, doesn't make a huge difference how exactly you mount it. Um, the only thing to be a little bit cognizant of is uh, those through holes on the right side uh, that are labeled uh, for programming do go all the way through. Uh, so don't ground those out against the chassis. Uh, in the center of this image you can see the RGH 1.2 diagram. I encourage you to take a screenshot uh, so you can reference back here, but you can see that we're going to use all of the points with the exception of D and E. D and E there will be left blank, so we'll use A, B, C, and F as well as power and ground. 
Uh, also, the little notice the little red line on the uh, the points where it indicates between slim and fat. Uh, that little red line means that you should bridge those two pads, and that is fairly important. So uh, don't miss that step. Make sure that you uh, you bridge uh, between those two pads where that little red blob is. So here we've gone ahead and pre-tinned the pads. Note we've left D and E without any solder on them because we're not going to use them. And then that point that we mentioned uh, repeatedly earlier that was just to the right of the NAND header points, that's our three volt uh, location that we're gonna draw power from. So we're just gonna go ahead and do that as our first install point and that will run to the uh, pad labeled VCC, uh, VCC uh, variable control. I, to be frank, I don't know what it stands for, but it's where the power uh, goes. <laughs> um, so we'll get that connected and then we'll do ground after that. So here we are stripping the end of the wire for the ground install. Uh, obviously the other end of the pad goes to where it says G and D ground on the uh, chip itself. Uh, then we just pre tin the end of the wire. And that little uh, spring clip that kind of comes off the back of the AV cable, uh, it'll hold some solder there real nice and easy. And then uh, that's where we just ground off to. So uh, real, real easy connection point, no problem. These two are the easiest install bits of the bunch. So from this point forward, uh, we're going to need access uh, to both sides of the motherboard. So we're going to need to remove it from the casing. And uh, I want to mention that the, the thermal bond that occurs between the thermal paste and the CPU and GPU, um, it's not something you really want to mess with if you can manage it. So you can lift up on the heat sinks there just a little bit, but I really like to avoid trying to manipulate the console by those as the more you mess with that CPU and GPU, the, the more likely you are to potentially cause some sort of uh, red ring type interaction. So the, the compression that happens, that thermal bond that's in there with the thermal paste as it dries out, it forms a really good bond between the heat sink and the CPU or GPU. But if you rock around uh, and, and you move around those heat sinks a whole bunch, it can kind of break that bond and ideally you would just apply new uh, thermal paste, but my general rule of thumb is if I don't have to remove the heat sinks or mess with that, then I don't. Um, so yeah, uh, basically you'll flip it over here and uh, the first point that we're actually going to install uh, will be the uh, B point on the chip, which is actually for post. So what we have to do is route it through a little through hole real near the X clamp here. Um, so we're going to take our Kynar wire, which is available uh, on Amazon for about $10 for a roll that's been enough for me to do um, dozens and dozens of consoles. And you want to feed it right through that little through hole area using a pair of tweezers to kind of force it through. Uh, then you can flip the console over and see that it comes out just on the other side of the GPU there. Uh, and again, this will eventually route to the post point or point B um, on the matrix chip. So if you go ahead and route it up and uh, terminate the end into the B point, we can then focus on the actual wire routing that we want to use. So uh, just strip the end off uh, and then uh, attach that to the B location on the glitch chip. So the wire routing we have to use is relatively uh, specific. This area right here is what you need to avoid routing near. Um, so what we want to do is essentially try to come straight out and then straight over along the heat sink here. So we're going to try to route that wire as, as directly following that path as we can uh, in order to avoid the spots that cause issues. Um, and just to be frank, I've, I've had consoles where I didn't worry about the wire routing. Uh, but you know kind of before this was figured out and it will absolutely cause the console to not boot at all um, if this wire routing is not followed uh, you might get lucky you, you might know of an alternative wire routing i'm not saying that other wire routings won't work but i'm saying that this one absolutely will work so what i've done is kind of held it straight out and bent uh, the wire and then i'll use a little bit of hot glue uh, to hold down that location so that we can kind of use it as a, a corner there. So then when I pull taut the wire from the underside of the board, 
we end up with those nice clean lines like I was suggesting. Straight out towards the heat sink, heat sink and then straight over again. So uh, straight out, straight over, down through the through hole and then watch as I pull a little bit of tension on there and then it just cleans it right up. So it's, it's nice and routed exactly the way that we want. Uh, so then on the other underside, um, the point C that we're going for here uh, is the end off to the end. It's not the same one as documented in many of the executor images. This is a, uh, a variation for the RGH 1.2 install, but we just kind of measure it out, uh, snip it off to the correct length, and then we'll route it under the X clamps and get it attached to the point. So here we've got it routed under the X clamps. We'll just position our wire right there next to that very end point. Uh, go ahead and pre-tin our pad a little bit, get a little bit of solder uh, stuck to it, uh, have a little bit of extra solder on the end of our iron there, and then uh, simply just tack it down. And that is our post uh, location. This point being fairly fragile, uh, make sure you use some flux paste. Don't hold an iron on it for too long. This is one that people uh, novices tend to, to kind of burn off and you can see even I'm having a little bit of problems getting this particular one to stick uh, but there it goes uh, so that is our uh, point B on this chip uh, for the uh, post out so the next point we're gonna do here is the PLL location uh, and we're gonna route it right through that little through hole to the side of the X clamp here this is the same point as mentioned in the older Executor RGH1 uh, guides and tutorials, so you can find an image to specifically identify that point within JRunner really easily. Um, the routing on this particular one can be a little difficult. You notice that I've got kind of, or I'm bending kind of a curve into the end of my wire, and that's so that as I hook it into the point, I can kind of get it going the direction that I want, and then further use the tweezers to kind of force feed it through the hole. And just as with the first one, when we flip the board back over, you should see the, the little lead coming out, which you can then just pull through the rest of the way. As I mentioned, this is the PLL point, so this is gonna go to pad F on the glitch chip. Um, so we just need to go ahead and, and strip the little end of it and get this one connected. And the nice thing is that the wire routing uh, can be done exactly the same as we did for the post or B point. So we can literally just lay our line directly on top of the old uh, or the first wire that we ran in order to position it properly to avoid the, the boot issues and stuff. So now that I've got it tacked down, I've got it connected where I can go, I can pull through enough excess uh, to route the wire like I need it and then just kind of hold it in place on top of the other line and then uh, just dab on just a, a bit more hot glue to hold that one down as well. So you can see how I'm using kind of a multi-finger uh, sort of setup there to hold down the uh, wire while I uh, get a little bit of glue on there. And then I'll pull it from the bottom side again to bring it taut so that there's a nice straight line from chip or AV housing over to heatsink and then kind of a straight line uh, following back over. So as I pull it right through, and that glue was still a little bit wet, so it kind of wanted to, uh, to pull out a line there, but that's still real nice. So it's straight up over to the heat sink and then straight over uh, to the through holes, avoiding our, uh, our problematic areas. So now that we're back uh, on the underside, we can go ahead and measure out uh, to our PLL point here, uh, trim up the wire, and then actually get that one attached. Now this point is again uh, a pretty fragile one, uh, so the PLL location is one that you're going to want to take your time with. Uh, make sure you use a little bit of flux paste, um, strip the end of your wire so that just the barest amount of metal is visible on the end here, uh, and then tin it before you attempt to connect uh, the wire. So put a little bit of solder on there first and then just kind of tack it all down. So uh, here I'll demonstrate. So you can see how I've got a little glob uh, of additional solder on there. 
and then I'll use the head of the tweezers to position my wire and then simple just little tack to liquefy the solder and insert the wire and there we go that's it uh, then we'll use the tweezers to kind of flatten down the wire where it needs to be so it's laid flat against the board and then for further kind of anchoring and protection we'll go with a little bit of hot glue in there uh, so that if anybody ever yanked on that wire um, that it wouldn't just immediately rip off the pad that it would have some support. So the next pad we're going to do is conveniently located just to the right here. Um, this is the RST point that was popularized in the RJTAG days. So if you look at the official Team Executor RJTAG documentation, it points to using this RST point. So there's two squares kind of together, and uh, from this perspective, it's the leftmost one. Then the wire routing that we're going to want to follow is down to below the heat sink, or X clamps over to the far side and then kind of a, a, a cornered or a rounded curve to the uh, inset area where the fan goes. So of course we give it just a little bit of hot glue near the anchor point there so that if anybody ever yanks on that thing they're not going to damage the pad. And then I'll actually use a little bit more hot glue over here on the corner and then right near where we pop up to the top side of the board. So we'll, we'll just pull it straight over to the side of the other X clamp, put another little dab of glue here. Um, we're not talking a lot. I mean, and this could be done with electrical tape or something instead if you don't have access to, uh, to hot glue. And then we want to kind of give it a little bit of extra length so it curves. Uh, and then we want to route it right to that corner because we're going to bend up and over that corner and run up to the glitch chip. Uh, and this is, to be clear, our RST point, which is going to go to pad A on the glitch chip. Alright, so now we've flipped the board back over. We can see that it's come up here and we just want to bend it easily right around that corner, run up to the glitch chip, and again, this wire, RST, is going to go right to the A pad on that glitch chip. So we'll just uh, trim off the end and then set that right in uh, the A position pad. So the final point that we're gonna need to do is the standby click or crystal or um, basically the clock feed. Uh, so CLK, which is gonna go to point C here. For this, I'm not using Kynar wire. I'm using our standard uh, 28 or 30 AWG stranded wire. And as you can see, we just connect that first to the top, feed it right through the through hole near the south bridge. Um, one of the uh, executor diagrams refers to using the CLK point right over there next to the, uh, the HANA. Um, but really, that point doesn't offer any advantage and is much more difficult to install, especially for novice users. So what we want to do is make sure that the uh, clock wire there doesn't interfere with the eventual positioning of the DVD drive. If the wire was taut between there and the through hole, you might end up with some problems putting your DVD drive back in. So you want it to go down to the board, over to the hole, and then pop up and through. Uh, and we'll just tack it down with a little bit of hot glue there. So as we flip the board over, uh, the location of the alternate standby click location uh, is, is actually really easy. If you just go straight up uh, from the through hole, you can see that little circle, circled point FT2R2. Uh, so we'll just trim our length just barely past that, tin up the end, and then tack that guy down. And that'll actually be our, our last uh, connection that we have to make in order to uh, uh, fully have our glitch chip wired in and installed. So it probably has a little bit of excess on the end of my wire here, but we'll just tin it up. Um, and then we'll pre-tin the pad. It's a nice big pad. It's a really easy install on this. Way better than the, uh, the one suggested in most of the Team Executor uh, images as it's tiny and fragile, where this is, is, most, is most definitely not. So nice little solder ball right there on that point. And then uh, again, just a little bit of hot glue uh, in case anybody yanks on that wire. Uh, we don't want to rip off the pad. So now that our glitch chip is fully installed, uh, we can go ahead and reseat the motherboard back into its casing. 
And uh, pretty much the last thing we need to do is get the glitch chip programmed with the appropriate timing file. Uh, I like to do this before I reinstall the fan because it's uh, significantly easier to access those holes. You can see the label on the chip matches easily with the label on the header. Uh, all I've done is insert just a tiny little bit of pin header in there and then I'm holding a little bit of pressure with my finger um, so that everything makes a good connection without having to solder to those pads. It's just uh, being conducted by the little bit of uh, through hole um, uh, pin header bit. So what we'll do is bring up JRunner here. We'll go to the advanced custom NAND CR functions. We're going to select XSVF because that's the timing files. And then what I have here is the RGH12 underscore 21 file. I find that one works almost without exception on all of these, so that's where I start. Uh, and I just click the run and say program. To demonstrate what it looks like on the chip side, when you say run, that little light lights up and then it goes off. So that's your confirmation that the, the chip received the programming or instructions. And now we're good to uh, partially reassemble the console, install the fan back in it, and uh, go ahead and attempt to boot Zell. So here what we've done is reinstalled the fan, the fan shroud, and the RF board on the front. Uh, we've got power, HDMI, and an Ethernet cable plugged into the rear of the console, and we'll go ahead and boot it up. And uh, if everything works as planned, uh, we got looks like two glitch cycles here. You can see the light flashing, and there is our successful boot. So we have uh, successfully gotten Zell to boot, which is what's going to deliver to us our CPU key. Now the way that I run this is by capturing the CPU key across the network. Uh, you see the network config down there, 192.168.1.119. Uh, I'll then enter that into my JRunner program and retrieve the CPU key across the network. Uh, so the console remains running here, the light blinking is totally normal. Uh, so we'll go into JRunner, we'll enter in that IP address, and I'll say get CPU key and it'll pull it across. If you don't have that configuration set up, you can literally just type the CPU key displayed in screen into this CPU key box. I'm just lazy. I don't want to type the whole thing out, so I pull it in across the network as a, a, a shortcut. Uh, we can then go ahead and power off our console because now with the CPU key, we have everything we need to create the final XE build image. So we'll need to go back to JRunner um, and, and I'm disconnecting the Ethernet cable here because I'm not going to connect this console to the Internet anymore. Um, but we're going to go back into JRunner, we're going to build the XE build image, and then the next thing we'll do is write that back to the console. So you can see here back in JRunner, we want to make sure that Glitch 2 is selected, and we've got our CPU key, we've got our original NAND dumps. So Glitch 2 selected, we can hit Create XE Build. Uh, which will output a whole bunch of text. Um, oh, if you get this question about SMC uh, bin found deleted, basically you always want to say yes. It's asking you, unless you put it there, do you want to delete it? And no, we didn't specifically put it there, so yes, we want to delete it, yes. Um, and, and then the build process will continue here, and at the end we'll essentially realize the output of a UPD flash dot bin. This is our modified um, glitch NAND image that we will write back to the console. So in the source field here, automatically loaded, you can see now that it says UPD flash.bin. We'll reconnect our NANDX, reconnect our standby power, and hit write. And we should uh, be writing our final image back to the console. So the same configuration that it was in to read, where standby power was applied and the NANDX was applied, um, is how you write that final NAND image back to the console. Um, so that'll take about three minutes to complete. So here we are, the, uh, the NAND written has, writing has finished. So we can go ahead and disconnect our NANDX. Uh, I like to do a power cycle, so I just disconnect and then reconnect the power. Uh, where HDMI is still plugged in, and when we boot this time, we should expect to see kind of a, a normal stock dashboard sort of experience. It is an XE build modified dash, so there's our, our boot confirmation via our little ring of light action. And that's exactly what we would expect to see, a, a, a standard Xbox 360 logo booting up to stock dash. 
but now the console is capable of running unsigned code. So as we uh, get ready to, we can load up XEX menu, freestyle dash, all that sort of stuff. So uh, at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and cut it off, remove the, the additional connections, and uh, we're really on the downhill side. It's just cleanup work here. So we want to remove our NAND headers, uh, wires, because there's no reason we're not going to need to write anything additional to the NAND. And if we did, we could do that in software now. Uh, so we'll just zip those up, clean everything off here, and uh, finish everything out. So as I remove these, I've gone ahead and just sped up this clip uh, because the, the only interesting part that kind of remains here is the software setup. Um, there are numerous tutorials that will be available to you or that are available for how to install like XEX menu to your USB. Uh, but what I'm going to go over here momentarily once the console is reassembled and everything's back together uh, is going to be how to um, install from a USB freestyle dash dash launch Aurora. Basically how I normally set up a console after I've modified it. So uh, w as you can see, we just go through the normal reassembly um, to get everything back together here. And then we'll do a standard boot and uh, then go ahead and get the console configured with all of the software that everybody really likes. And the whole purpose of making an RGH in the first place is to run that modified software. All right, so we're connecting power and HDMI to the console now. And uh, everything is, should still work as we boot it up here. Uh, there, there should be no reason that we wouldn't get a normal boot. Uh, and there is our multicolor ring of light that we set up before. And the console boots up to uh, a normal looking dashboard here. So we get the standard boot logo um, and stock dash. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and insert, uh, after syncing and controller here, uh, we'll go ahead and insert my USB uh, and then copy over some stuff like uh, XEX menu and then use that to uh, make some further modifications here. So if we go over to the games tab right now, you see nothing. There's, there's no software installed here. Um, but once we go ahead and insert my USB that's preloaded with some stuff, uh, the first thing that's likely to happen is that the console is likely to ask for the avatar update. Uh, I keep the avatar update installed on my USB here, uh, so we'll see if we get that prompt. And it looks like we probably are going to. So here a little bit sped up as uh, it prompts us for uh, the update, and I declined it, and then I copy and paste XEX menu onto the hard drive. Um, now that we have got XEX menu loaded, I'm going to go ahead and say yes to the update, uh, which you can see and the USB goes to town. This is a normal and thing that, that, that hangs out for a second, and then it just rebooted. Nice, quick, fast boot. And uh, the Xbox is rebooted, or rebooting. Uh, so now the avatar update is installed, uh, which is proven by the point that my little TWM profile has a little avatar guy. So I'll just sign into it, whatever, say no at the Can't Connect Xbox Live. Uh, we can go into XEX menu now, and we won't get prompted for the update because we just installed it. So here at the main XEX menu, I'm going to have to press right bumper. That brings me to the USB 0. I can go down to that's where Aurora Dash is. I'm pressing Y, going down to copy, pressing A. I'm pressing right on the D-pad. That brings me to the hard drive. I'm going to press Y again, and go down to paste, and press A. So now I just copied and pasted Aurora onto the hard drive, right? And that takes just a few seconds here. Now I'm going to press left on the D-pad to go back to the USB. I'm going to grab dash launch. So again, I press Y. I go up to copy. I press A. I press right on the D-pad to go back to hard drive. I press Y. I go down to copy, paste. I press A. So we just pasted dash launch really fast because dash launch is super tiny. And 
finally, I will get Freestyle Dash. So I press left on the D-pad to go back to USB 0. I go down to Freestyle, press Y. I go up to Copy. I press A. I press right on the D-pad. I press Y. I go down to Paste, press A. Now I just copied and pasted Freestyle onto the hard drive. So now, as you can see, it says Hard Drive 1. I've got Aurora. I've got Dash Launch. And I've got Freestyle. So I'm going to go ahead and launch Dash Launch. And then I will set up what I want for my default boot. Dash Launch tells me it's an older version. That's fine. We, we anticipated that. We want it to update. So we just say yes. Uh, now we want to go to Paths. The default path indicates what will boot by default. We're going to go to the hard drive, which is where we just placed files, right? And I'm going to make this one default boot Aurora. And so we'll select that Aurora.xex. So now you see the default boot is set to hard drive Aurora slash Aurora.xex. I'm going to press right bumper, which brings me to the save, load, launch INI. So we've made the setting. Now we have to save the setting. I'm going to go down to the hard drive. And I'm going to press X. And that in the lower left, you can see setting save to hard drive launch.ini. So now when I press B to exit dash launch, um, it's going to perform its default action, which means launching Aurora Dash. So as one final little demonstration, uh, we'll go ahead and power off the console. I will remove my USB. I'll place it off to the side. And now, because that software is loaded on the hard drive, when I power on the console, the console will default boot directly into Aurora Dashboard. So here in just a second, you're going to see that we get a nice fast boot still. And when I go to the Xbox screen, uh, it's powering up, and it's going to do so directly into Aurora Dashboard. It's not going to even hit the standard stock dash. So there comes Aurora, and here we go. That's it. This console is totally RGH, and this would be exactly the sort of condition that I would ship one out in. Uh, it would boot directly into Aurora like this. You could then bring up the system menu. You could go to like File Manager go into the hard drive, and you could launch, say you want freestyle instead, go into the freestyle folder, and launch that default.xex for freestyle. And now, rather than Aurora Dash, I'm in freestyle Dash. And if you wanted to, you could change that default setting within Dash Launch and make this be your default boot, or you could blank out that default boot altogether and make the stock dashboard your default, uh, which is probably what you would want to do if you're going to go online. So, yeah, we are completely finished with this console. It is totally RGH and fully functional. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned something. Later.